This episode of the Gentleman's Golf Law Podcast is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon. Go to patreon.com slash gentsgolflaw to help produce the show. You are listening to the Gentleman's Golf Law Podcast. Listener beware. Rise and shine, the liquor store is open. I ain't got time for moping. I best be on my way Well, I still got time to save my reputation. Time to go. Halloween, everybody. Welcome to the Gentleman's Golf Law Podcast, the podcast for the rebel and the renaissance man. I'm Jordan Crowder and uh, co-hosting. This is really hard to do for the listeners that are listening online. I'm not on video. Before I do this next intro, I'm going to take off some of these accoutrements here. But you could go you on great. YouTube. You look great. Keep it on. <laughs> on YouTube, you can see keep our it costumes. <laughs> All right, I'll keep the mask on and I'll take off this gator. And maybe now you could hear me better. How's that sound? That sounds fantastic. <laughs> right. And co-hosting, guest co-hosting with me today is uh, Wheelchair Batman. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. Just uh, enjoying the darkness and brooding of this world. If you'll notice, because it's Halloween, I actually put on a little witch's hat. It looks so, really good. So now I'm a, a spooky... A spooky witch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that looks that's a good look on you. Uh, and what is what is your costume that you were? Uh, well, what? I'm I'm uh, I'm supposed to be a plague doctor. I was trying to pick a 2020 appropriate uh, costume. Um, I don't know that it quite works because the glasses that I bought, uh, I can't see through them. They're just frosted, and that's what you get for buying your costume at a Dollar King. Um, well, you know, a lot of my uh, actual Batman gear is bought at uh, Dollar Tree. Oh, okay. So, a competitor. Yes, uh, my entire utility bill is uh, filled with items I got from the Dollar Tree. Not many people know that, so there's great stuff there. Yeah, for sure. I mean, what I mean, what kind of stuff you get there for your utility belt? Toilet paper, hand sanitizer, and normal stuff. Normal stuff. That is just all kind of compresses and, and folds into the to the utility belt. That makes yeah, sense. most people think that uh, being a bad man is uh, mostly about crime fighting, but really the most important thing is learning how to go to the bathroom in the suit. <laughs> That's, that is priority number one. I'm going to take this off because I can't speak – over over here on this my nose keeps getting in the way of the mic and i feel like that's going to be very annoying um of course with us uh we have uh the one and only uh zach zachary anner thanks thanks for joining us man <laughs> thanks for having you blew my secret identity i, I was did. doing the Voice and everything. I know. Uh, I just know that we've shot with that voice before, and that is a hard voice to sustain over a, it, a whole podcast. You can't really period. keep it up. No, it's <laughs> it's tough. But uh, my normal voice is probably even more grating on the audience. So I appreciate them putting up with it. Yeah, yeah, they're they're a gracious audience for sure. Um, how how are you doing, man? How you been? Uh, you know, could complain, but won't. <laughs> like, honestly, uh, given everything that is still going on, I am I'm glad that there's uh at least a reason to be festive. Yes, for sure. You got any uh Halloween plans uh for quarantine or are you, uh, what are you what are you gonna do? Well, the thing that we don't know is if there are gonna be any trick or treaters coming that we would scold. Yeah. Yeah. Or if we want to have candy just out in a dish. Yeah. The, and then, it look like, I don't know what to do because I don't want to disappoint the kids. Yeah. But I also don't want to encourage them. Yeah. I don't know. It's kind so of a catch 22. What's, what's the protocol on your end? I don't, well, I think we're just supposed to stay in the house. I don't think that the kids are allowed to trick or treat right now. Well, um, so, um, goodness, but <laughs> you, you think that there's going to be like that, that one parent that's like, who cares? The 
pandemic is going on. We need to get you. You're not rageous. Exactly. And, and I don't want to like make the kid feel bad, but I also want to care. I want the parents to feel very bad. Well, maybe you so, should have like two sets of candy, one for the parents and then give like an apple, uh, give candy to the kids and then like an apple to the parents. Uh, well, what we should do is have candy for the kids and then just a basket for the parents. And it's all individual notes that say, how dare you? <laughs> how dare you? Yeah, that'd be that'd be pretty that'd be pretty productive, I think. I yeah. think that, uh, that'll that'll help definitely, uh, you know, win some people over. Uh, by the way, I should mention that we've got uh, a guest coming on later. Her name is Lisa Morton. She is the. I would say the, uh, you know, essential Hollywood, uh, Hollywood, Halloween historian, uh, written lots of books on it, uh, has lots of, we- uh, has the encyclopedia of Halloween um, on the internet, uh, but she wrote a great book called Trick or Treat, the History of Halloween, and also Calling the Spirits, the History of Seances, so, ooh, it's going to be spooky. <laughs> ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever been to a séance, Jordan? No, I haven't. I've been to the Magic Castle, though. <laughs> I you have to be invited in, and nobody's ever invited me. <laughs> no, well, I can I change that. I met a magician once that said, like at a party, and he said, "I'll get you into the Magic Castle," and then nothing. Really, nothing. I feel like that's yeah. the mo of a lot of magicians at the Magic Castle. Yeah. That's the one, the one big draw, like, cause when they say I'm a magician, you're sort of like, but you're an adult. (laughs) And then (laughs) they're like, oh, we'll get you into the magic castle. It's like, yeah, I'll be on board with that, that BS, whatever that is. I want to go to that. (laughs) Yeah. Oh man. They're just, they're just lording it over you. They're not showing, they're also showing you that they're not a real, a responsible adult by sticking to their word. Uh, Yeah. if you know, any, as far, well, oh, go ahead. Oh no, I was gonna say, if you know any people that are that work as like first responders in Los Angeles, they can get you in. They just call in and get booked. So, like any firemen, policemen, uh, you know, EMS workers, they'll uh, they can get you in there. So, so that was you, how I got in. You piggyback <laughs> off of the of the perks. From the sacrifice of being a first responder, no, you said, uh, "Yeah, I could go in too. I do a podcast. Yeah. I'm the same thing." Exactly. No, he's actually a friend of ours who's LAPD. His wife and and him invited us to go. They had heard we, uh, Lacey and I, had never been, and so they booked it. It was like you had to book out like three or four months in advance, um, but it was fun. It was a couple of November's ago. It was a good time. I don't even know if I could keep track of how many Novembers since <laughs> I've done something. Yeah, I know. I don't. It's it's been a been a crazy year. Have you been you been doing anything? You've been working on anything? Or you just been sitting on your ass uh, eating <laughs> Cheetos? I, mean, I wear this most days. I wear the <laughs> Batman mask most days, and uh, I have been doing things. But I think I've been doing like what normally would be two like two weeks worth of work over the stretch of eight months yeah. and and uh, that work feels more exhausting yeah than it did when i was like it was just a part of my normal busy schedule yeah. now you have actually kept up a uh, a pretty full career during this whole <laughs> past whatever however long it's been if by full career you mean smoking pipes and recording it and putting <laughs> putting it on the internet yes, I do. what else has it when has it ever been busier than that uh, i don't know i uh i we that's the one thing is like having the downtime we did do a lot of podcast episodes but for the most part it's like there's a lot of downtime for the first front end of everything for at least for me it's it was, it was pretty it was exhausting to not have anything to do. It's a full time job. Podcasts for everyone's non existent commutes to <laughs> yeah. work. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. And like, I think as soon as like the it, it, the lockdown hit, um, there was like all these podcasts about being in lockdown. And it was like, that's not going to be sustainable. Like, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I really feel like my life has gotten way less interesting. <laughs> the, like, 
I couldn't I couldn't come up with a half an hour of of gab with you. Like we're doing this once and I feel like I've prepared for this for the past two months <laughs> just to have this little bit of banter back and forth. <laughs> and now I'm fresh out. You're that's so, it. There's nothing, nothing more to talk about. <laughs> nothing more to talk about. But oh. are are you? Because normally you get very into Halloween. Are you doing any like virtual uh, we, parties? We talked about going through. There's like a drive-through haunted house thing that you could do in L.A. So we might be doing that. But oh wow, I know. used to remember like haunted car washes and stuff. Oh really? I've never been to one of those. That's crazy. You've never been to a haunted car wash? No. How does that work? I well, <laughs> the, the you know how in a haunted house. Uh, they have like monsters and vampires and stuff that jump out from behind corners and like spooky rooms. Yeah. It's like that, except instead of jumping out and scaring you, they jump out with a squeegee. (laughs) (laughs) It's kind of hard to take a monster seriously with a squeegee. You know, it's it's nice because like, well, if you were going to get your car washed anyway, might as well do it in the spirit of the season. I feel like when your monster is the help, the relationship of scariness <laughs> is, is unbalanced. Yeah, it's just like a werewolf jumps out and then you're like, do I tip this guy or is that included in the thing? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know how to how it tip. I always just give a guy five bucks at a car wash. I don't know. Like, I just assume that there's a, there's supposed to be a tip involved. That's nice. That's nice. That's, I feel like that's good. It's like, but like, I it has to be a five dollar bill because if you hand five one dollars, you just look like a cheap. Can't cheapskate. do it. No. You can't do it. And then if you just hand them a one, then you feel like a real a <laughs> hole. This is all I had in my shoe. Yeah, <sighs> sorry, I didn't know we were gonna go and do this whole exchange. <laughs> I just wanted to scare my my kid and get my Subaru washed. <laughs> I actually had an experience getting a car wash. Actually, your old van, the white van, uh, I got it washed for you once when I borrowed it. And I went in and there was like a like a grease mark or something on it. And then the guy was like pointing to it. And like he he was speaking Spanish, we were trying to communicate, and he was pointing to it like there's something wrong with it or whatever. And I was like, "Uh, all right, well, I'll figure it out." And then I hand him the tip for five bucks, and he goes, "Hold on, wait a sec." And he goes and gets like something and sprays it on, and then rubs it off. So I think the five dollar tip got it off. So there was a level of service that that five dollars elevated you to exactly. That's cool. So maybe if I gave him five ones, it would, he just would have left it on there. I was like, I yeah. don't know. I don't know what that is. It looks like just like someone that would just come off. But anyway, I feel like that was not something that you did in your your time with the van. I'm in fact, I'm sure it's not. <laughs> Who knows? You're not responsible whatsoever. <laughs> All right. Uh, anything? Uh, anything? Uh, I mean, we on the past Halloween episodes, we've talked about spooky stories that have happened in our life. We've used up all of ours on our, on this show. Do you have any sort of uh, spooky interactions that you could recall? Real spooky stories. I, I I feel like I'm the type uh, that would be susceptible to anything scary, like any scary movie or something. Yeah. Like I'll I won't sleep for days or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but it's sort of uh, the spookiest time that i've ever had is when when uh when my dad cooked that chicken teriyaki in a tent and then a bear came oh, into, wow. like outside of the tent and uh because there was like the one we went to the allegheny mountains and the one thing they said is don't uh don't cook in the tent <laughs> and my dad was like yeah just a little stir fry won't be a big deal <laughs> and then and then uh Lo and behold, at at night we heard this huffing and saw this big bear shadow outside of the tent. And then we're like, "Oh, the bear's going to attack us any minute because he can smell that chicken teriyaki." <laughs> oh, and uh, and we just stayed like dead still and waited for the bear to get bored. And he just took a jump 
<laughs> beside our tent. Really? And then we got out of there the next morning. Oh, wow. Uh, How did you that sleep was, that It's not like a ghost, but, uh, <laughs> you know. Bears are, I, I would say bears are scarier than ghosts. Yes, I would <laughs> I would say so too. That's insane. I mean, I would. I, I've watched a lot of Alone. I don't know if you've seen that series, but uh, every no, time. No, but I, I've, I've been alone a lot, yeah, so, so I kind of know what it's like. Yeah, you're familiar with the process. But he's uh They always, they always just like when a bear comes by their tent, they always just yell, "Hey bear, hey bear!" <laughs> I'm like, what is that? They've all been yeah. taught to say, "Hey bear." <laughs> Yeah, I saw a video where a bear was like attacking somebody's <laughs> boat, and it, she was just like, "Bear, stop attacking the boat!" Oh, like, I don't know that the bear is responding to bear. <laughs> yeah. Like, if you like, in language, that bear probably has a name. If you started yelling at me, human or <laughs> young boy with lady's haircut, <laughs> like. Well, I wouldn't respond. It's just what what who taught them how to interact with bears and reason with bears? I don't know. I feel like every like it's I think it's just everybody has an idea of how to deal with bears in wildlife, but nobody really knows. <laughs> nobody knows for real. They're just like Yeah, but I think that that's yeah, that's perfectly <laughs> right because the guy who made the movie on how to interact with bears got eaten by a bear. Yeah. That you talking yeah. about uh, Grizzly Man? Grizzly Man. Yeah, that's a, that was a terrifying movie. That was kind of haunting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and like, like it's it's terrible, and it's nice that he was like going out and trying to like humanize bears. But if it ends with you getting eaten alive, then doesn't that sort of like negate the, <laughs> the positive yeah. message? Yeah, it totally. Yeah, that's it. That that movie went the other way for that guy, but <laughs> I don't know. I still apparently. People have said they've listened to that tape of him getting attacked by the bear, and it's terrifying. Ooh. But I don't know. I could. I, I'll, I'll be fine without it. No thanks. <laughs> no. I'm okay. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm good. All right. Let's take. A, I'm going to go to a segment we like to call listener mail. All right. Uh, this is the time on the show where we interact with you, the listener. You can interact with us on all the social media platforms of your choice. We're on all of them. Or you could call and leave a voicemail at man 81 scoff uh, for a chance to be featured on the show. Um, I put it out on Instagram, uh, asked, what are your 2020 uh, Halloween-themed costumes? Uh, 2020 themed Halloween, Halloween-themed costumes. 2020 yeah, costume one of those. Is quarantine gonna be? <laughs> yeah, let's get it. So I got a couple of them here. Uh, we've got one from Security Samwise. He says, "I might borrow the Ghost of Christmas Future cloak that I wore in last year's Christmas program." So uh, that's that. That feels appropriate. <laughs> yeah, feel because right? I I've definitely felt like this whole past year has just been a cloaked specter pointing at my grave <laughs> like yeah. it feels i feel like uh i'm definitely uh i feel a lot older uh and a lot more frail than i did just at the beginning of 2020 wow way to bring it down Zach. <laughs> no. oh no is this is this supposed to be a joyous discussion of everything that's going on no i'm just kidding i you. didn't know that was the angle yeah we're doing we're great supposed to this ignore everything zach i love i i've loved these past these past <laughs> like nine months this has been great it's been ten, it's been such a great time no, no negative things have happened. <laughs> well, you must love being in Buffalo for nine months and going into the winter season. I mean, isn't that a blessing? <laughs> uh, well, I'll tell you what is a blessing. What's <laughs> been a blessing is to be able to spend this time with my family, yeah. who who I love, and uh, and we had a nice summer, and uh, it's all downhill from here. <laughs> like, Oh, and uh, I, I think I'm just very grateful, but I'm very grateful, but still uh, sad. 
Yeah. If that makes sense. Of course. Yeah, I get that for sure. It's it's definitely it's it's definitely a it's it's a it's a time where like two things could both be true. I mean, it's nice to have all this time with family and then to slow down for a bit, but there's also a lot of uncertainty out there and a lot of uh, uncertainty, a lot of a lot of people going through a lot of really hard times. Yeah. And uh, and uh, we're at once very lucky. Uh, but you know, you can't forget about everything that everyone else is going it's through. True. You can't, you can't pull a Kim Kardashian and just whisk all of your friends away to a private Island for your 40th birthday. Wow. Did she do that? Did you see that? Did you no, see that? I didn't. Yeah. Yeah. She said, I, I, she was so grateful that all of her friends were able to quarantine so that they could all go to a, a private Island Island together. <laughs> Wow. And uh, just hang out and like things are normal. Wow. And it's uh and it didn't necessarily go over that great. I couldn't Which, imagine it would. <laughs> no. Unless Kanye was there. Doesn't isn't it all like water off a duck's back for him? He could say or do anything and he's he's still he's still popular. <laughs> well, that's because he's Kanye West. He's got that <laughs> brand where that's built into the brand. It's true. But he, was, he wasn't there. No. Well, what's, what's the point of that? What's the point of partying without Kanye West? Uh, I don't know. I've never partied without Kanye <laughs> West, know. so I've never partied. I know. It's it's crazy. <laughs> so we also got Eric Anderson said he's going to be Marshall from Paw Patrol because I'm cool like that. Super cool like that. It's pretty cool. Uh, we've got. I don't know what that is. I don't know either. But uh, sounds like some children's dog show. Is that yeah uh, about I, right? I think it's about dog a dog dog like a uh, police force. <laughs> well, when I was growing up, and when probably when you were growing up, we had McGruff. Yeah, the crime you remember dog. Remember McGruff? Yeah, I do. I also remember Take Pound a bite out of crime. <laughs> yeah, that was a good one. I liked. I liked the little. They did like these little like short segments on cartoon on um, Saturday morning cartoons that were just like about crime with C C McGruff, the crime dog. Yeah. I was, I was the only one I think that really took those anti drug messages from the eighties to heart. I was yeah. like, he's the, the, this dog is telling me not to do it. I respect this dog. <laughs> He's got a trench coat and a hat. <laughs> yeah, better listen to him. He better. I mean, I, I I think so too. Like I just I I mean I've never done any dr drugs per se, but I've I didn't start uh, drinking any alcohol really until I met your brother Brad, and he had fancy beers, and I realized that I liked fancy beer instead of frat house beer. <laughs> wow. Uh, see, my, my my brother, his taste in beer is directly correlated to his financial situation. Like he will he will get the Keystone Ices if he has to, but if he has a little money, then he'll get like the fancy beers that come with a a cork and stuff. So, like I, it feels like you should be drinking this in the 14th century. <laughs> yeah. Like it's just like a beer that a monk would drink. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what I actually, one of the first ones, I forget what it was, but it was, it had a monk on it actually was the one that I, that I really liked. And I was like, Oh man, there's other beers other than Coors Light. So, uh, that's what, that, that was the gateway drug for me. <laughs> um, we've got one yeah. more response. Uh, this one comes from Lacey Prince. She says, the who's, half, that? who's that? Uh, she says the half dressed person in a zoom meeting business on the top party on the bottom. So what, what oh, yeah. So she's going as, as uh, Jeffrey Tubin. <laughs> Jeffrey That's Tubin, exactly. <laughs> oh man. Well, you're, are you, are you Jeffrey Tubin in right now? Do you got any pants on or I don't, I don't Tubin it when I'm, 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 podcasting no you don't I, I think there's a time and a place to tubing and it's not when you're on a zoom call <laughs> i've got half a tubing i've got my uh sweatpants on but i've got my uh my normal like henley shirt on top yeah so. i've got my sweatpants on and i didn't know that was the bar <laughs> i i thought you meant am i completely naked underneath yeah yeah have you ever done that 
sweatpants are formal wear for me. You yeah. know that. Yeah, that's true. You've got some fancy ones too. Don't you have like some velvet f- sweatpants and that kind of stuff? I do. I yeah. do. My velvet sweatpants, unfortunately, <laughs> are in the in the storage unit that you packed up. Oh no. Do you want me to go get them for you? Do you need no, them? No, no, because okay. all, uh, all uh, an entire par- apartment's worth of stuff is in front of all of my stuff. <laughs> it's true. I know. I went back to put a few extra things in there, and I was like, oh, this thing is filled up now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good times. You know, I wonder if I'll ever get back there or, or they'll just have my stuff on, like, Storage Wars or something. <laughs> no. You can't let that happen, Zach. Eh. Eh. I'll go. I'll go and pull some things no, out it's for fine. you. It's fine. Let's just leave it. We'll <laughs> leave, leave it, it there. there. Leave it there. Um, you know, I had uh, last night. I had some halal guys. It's not sitting too well with me. I think I went a little overboard on that hot hot sauce. So oh, okay. I have got to go. Uh, you know, uh, occupy the washroom, as we say in Canada. Um, but we'll take a quick break, and uh, we'll be back with Lisa Moore. Sure. Hello, gentlemen, Scofflaws. Thanks so much for being a loyal listener of the show. And your feedback and support is really what keeps us going and means a lot to us. So sincerely, thank you again. Now, if you're a fan of the show and you want to take your support to the next level, why not support the show on Patreon? We offer all sorts of extras on there like outtakes, extended interviews, a bonus movie podcast, and behind-the-scenes content. Better yet, we have options that start as little as a dollar a month. You pay more for that at a parking meter to go in and grab a cup of coffee at Starbucks. See what I did there? If you're interested in helping support the show, please check out patreon.com slash gentscofflaw or click the support link on the website. Again, that's patreon.com slash gentscofflaw. We look forward to having you as part of our team. Yeah, uh, well, just, uh, I don't know what Jordan's doing. It takes a long time in the bathroom. Just give him a no- ah. Hello. Oh. Hey. Hi. Uh, I wasn't expecting you. Hello. Who is- How are you doing, Hello. Zachary? I am, oh, glad. I am so I'm glad. It's so good to see you. I'm sorry, Jordan's not here no, for he's some not reason. Here. He's never here when I try to visit. I don't know what that's all about. But uh, see, nice I, to meet you, Zachary. I'm Vlad the Vampire. I've heard so much about you. You look uh, not exactly like I expected, uh, but uh, certainly a handsome vampire. Well, thank you very much. I spent a lot of time working on my skin care, especially during the quarantine. I have a lot of extra time on my hands. So you've, you've been quarantining as a vampire? Yes, yes, yes. You see, a lot, not a lot of people realize that uh, as a vampire and all of the monster community, COVID is actually something that can affect all of us, just like it affects the world. So I have to stay inside and I can't see my vampire friends. I can't see my werewolf friends. I can't see my mommy friends. So who are you missing the most? I think I I miss very much having uh, the ladies over, having a woman <laughs> to, uh, you know, some companionship. Uh, that has been very tough for me. But uh, I've had uh, found other ways to cope. You know, I've been trying different hobbies and activities. Really? Uh, what 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 does a, a vampire do in quarantine for a hobby? Well, I I tried at first. I I, I watched very much of the show uh, alone, and I I got <laughs> into a bushcraft thing where it's kind of like uh, you know wilderness survival. But uh, <laughs> I learned that I. I, uh, when I had to make the shelter, it involved a lot of wooden stakes, and that was, of course, a problem for me. I didn't, I didn't realize that you had a shelter other than a coffin. Were you really just sprucing that up, or what? I was trying to get out a little bit, you know, being stuck inside, trying to be more active, being, being more in tune with nature, uh, but that didn't quite work out. Uh, so I, I tried, uh, you know, making the sourdough bread, uh, 
But as you know, as a vampire, I cannot eat bread. And uh, I try to... carb, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I know. Just I... Now, if you try to eat bread, uh, unlike most of us, you just uh, vomit uncontrollably instead of putting on weight, right? Yes, this is what happens. I tried to come up with a solution where I made uh, a yeast out of the human yeast. But... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that did not work out very well. It doesn't rise very well in the oven. So what are you doing to, um, how are you uh, eating healthy in this time? Because I know that's a struggle for a lot of people. Well, I order a lot of Postmates. Uh, so I eat the Postmates, the actual Postmates, <laughs> when they deliver to me. I Okay, eat, so you yes. eat the, the Postmate delivery person themselves. Yes, exactly. Okay. Exactly. So now, that that has been sustaining me, but uh, so far they have blocked my account. So uh, I I have a stuck pile that I am working from, but uh, pretty soon I'll probably have to use something like, a, I don't know, like a Uber Eats or something like that. A DoorDash. You could get some good deals on DoorDash. Yes, DoorDash. If they have a good coupon, I am open to it. Yeah, and uh, the... Uh, are you struggling as much as as all your human counterparts are with just sort of uh, just loneliness and things like that? Yes, very, very much. Uh, it's very hard for me. I mean, one of the hobbies that I that I took up was uh, getting very into fountain pens. And because I got into fountain pens, I wrote letters to all my friends. Uh, but uh, nobody writes back to a vampire. So many people are just on email these days. I don't know. And the, the, with the... Sometimes the postal service during the pandemic is a little slower. I wouldn't necessarily, uh, you know, count out any of your friends. I mean, I, have you been able to turn into a bat at all? or Not you know? really. Not really, because uh, it doesn't, you know, the ever since the COVID-19, uh, uh, the coronavirus, there's a stigma with the bats. Uh, so, oh, yeah, yes. I didn't really think about how hard it would be to go around as a bat. Yes. People would be judging you, yes, blaming exactly. you for COVID and exactly. things. Exactly. I did not want the blame because I am a good vampire. I did receive one message back from uh, my friend, the werewolf, and all it said was, you suck. And uh, <laughs> that was it. He spent all that time to put it in the mail, find a, find a stamp. It was uh, a lot of effort for a cruel joke. It's a, a pretty sick burn, you know, like a werewolf, uh, just a werewolf using the mail. You got to give him some credit for that. Yes. I mean, are you sure that it was said in jest or could he have just been stating a fact? Because you do suck a lot of blood and stuff. It's true, but the werewolf is a bully. He has a track record of being a bully. Oh, he's a bully. Yes. yes. Yeah. But Maybe you just need to get some better friends. Have you been doing any? I don't know if your mind control powers work uh, with uh, potential victims on Zoom or if that translates. Let me see. Let me see. Let me try right now. Zachary. Zachary, come to my house so I can eat you. Zachary. Zachary. But there's a pandemic. See, I guess it did not work it's very logical. well. Yes. I, I think it worked, but then the logic kicked in. Yes, that's the, the problem is it can block the logic on over Zoom, I guess. I mean, I would I would jump jump at the chance to come and visit you without uh, if you weren't going to eat me, but I do think that's what would happen. Perhaps, perhaps, perhaps. And how often have you been able to murder? Is it just the podcast or the the Postmates? Just Is it just just the Postmates, and uh, every once in a while, somebody uh, who is uh, coming along you know, looking for food, they become my food. That's great. That's great. And are you, are you struggling like everyone else is with weight gain and things like that? Or is it just, are you trying and, uh, manage your, your food and not overeat? I try not to overeat, not so much of the weight gain, but because I have to uh, make it last longer. 
Uh, but yeah. for a vampire, uh, it's very hard to gain weight as a vampire. We are what they call an ectomorph, which is uh, a, a, a person that is very skinny and uh, cannot gain weight if they tried. I, I don't know if I'd say very skinny. I mean, well, you're, I mean, I would say that you have a a stocky build. I, not like I would not say real that. thin or anything. When I look in the mirror, I cannot see, so it's very difficult for me to gauge what I look like. But uh, no. I think I am a young, slim gentleman. <laughs> yeah, you, you. I mean, you're the vampire, so you know what vampire builds are. Yes, um, yes. But how long can a vampire survive in quarantine? What does a vampire need? Vampire needs a steady diet of uh, human blood and uh, definitely the companionship of a lady and uh, big elaborate social parties, which is very <laughs> difficult. Big elaborate social parties? <laughs> yes, I like to host. What's your favorite type of person to eat? Would you say like is there a different like uh, if you had to to say oh this is like the delicacy? What type of person would you most like to feast upon? Well, I cannot eat the Italian because of uh, the garlic they consume is oh, too much yeah. for me, and it gives me a very uh, very bad stomach ache. Um, but well, I've got some good news for you. I don't think that many Italian people are bathing themselves in garlic these days. No, that might just be. It stays in the bloodstream. Oh, I see. Yes. So if you eat a lot of Italian food, then there's still some garlic there. Exactly. Uh, but what do you use to season things when garlic is off the table? Uh, typically, I buy some uh, everything but the bagel spice from Trader Joe's. <laughs> I don't even know what's in that. I thought for sure there would be garlic in there. No, but it's it's I think it's everything but garlic and salt. What? There's no salt in an everything bagel? I don't My think God. so. Dude, like I don't know that that's right, Vlad, but I if it's not killing you then you must know what you're talking about. Yes, I do. I do very much. It's like it's very much like I can't I can't eat gluten either. I can't eat people that eat gluten. Oh, Vlad so is very gluten-free. Yes. So, you know, that's, that's a big thing. What happens if you eat gluten? Uh, I I become a little bit, I get like a migraine a little bit. And uh, I I just can tell that my body doesn't like it. It's just a feeling I have, you know. I feel better when I don't eat gluten. <laughs> Just a little bit migrainy, maybe a little bit gassy. Exactly, exactly. So I, w- I wish that there was some way that I could help you be less lonely because I do feel for you. You know, you're you're immortal. You, you got nothing but time, but I, I don't know that there's anything I can do. Do you know any ladies that uh, maybe want to be vampire? I, well, I'm on Bumble, but Bumble? I tried very much to use the dating apps, but because I do not have a pulse, uh, the touch screen for swiping left and right does not work for me. Oh yeah. You can't swipe. You can't no. swipe. I didn't no. know that. So mostly I get stuck on the leftovers that nobody wants because everybody swipe on it. And that's what I get. Well, you know, every single person I think has something to offer, even if that's just as a snack for you. Yes. Yes, perhaps. You might not, like, I think it's maybe being just a little superficial, Vlad. Maybe, maybe, you know, if you don't like the look of someone, maybe they would still taste great. Yes, perhaps, but I'm very much looking for a quarantine queen. You know, somebody (laughs) I could, I can have a, Rain the castle with me. Oh, okay. You know what I mean? Somebody to spend a life with that is, uh, that is, that, that will help take the reins in my vampire empire. Oh, I see. So, somebody to help, uh, take over the world with. I'm assuming that's a vampire's goal. Exactly. You know, it's just like the song Would You Be My Quarantine? Is this the way it ends? 
<laughs> oh no, Fred. Oh, I'm so lonely, Fred, Zach. I, I, I don't need you to cry. I, 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 I'm so lonely, Zach. I'm Zachary, sorry. I'm maybe, sorry. Zachary, maybe, maybe I could bite you and we could be vampire together. We could be friends. As much as I would love to be your quarantine queen, I just don't know that that's in the cards for me. I mean, Please. But you've already, you're already there with the hairdo. It, you're halfway there. We good friends. We have good rapport. You well, could, my, you could be. I know. You could be. We could both be king of the castle. I mean, do you even have like grab bars in your bathroom? Grab bars? I can I can install grab bars. I can go to Home Depot. It needs to be accessible. I don't know. Like, is the does the castle have ramps? The castle doesn't have ramps, but if you become a vampire, you can float. I don't know. I don't trust it. I like I like this wheelchair. Even if I could float, I don't think I would float. Well, you can. I you can be. You know, like you can make I, I'm craft. so sorry. I gotta. I I, I gotta. <laughs> Please, you know, Zachary. we can talk Please. about this later. I'm so Please. sorry. I, I'm getting another call on the no, Skype. No, I'm no, sorry. Zachary. We got to take a short break, but uh, we'll be back. Men or women, this one's for you. Let me take a second to talk to you about GORUCK. Now, you've heard us on this show talk about their awesome endurance events, which are, you know, great for fitness and team building. But, of course, they are known for their amazing gear. Some of the best gear in the world, actually. I, myself, own a GR1 rucksack for all my rucking and training. I also have one of their uh, 30-pound ruck plates, which is so convenient because I could just drop it in the laptop compartment on my bag, and I have a weighted ruck. It's super cool. But one of my all time favorite things that they offer are their sandbags. Now, if you've never trained with a sandbag, you're in for a treat. I love that you can keep it in the trunk of your car and take it to the park and you have a gym anywhere. Ever try doing sandbag man makers with 60 pounds? I mean, you get a fun and very hard training session in really quickly. Um, it's a big bag of suck in all the right ways. Now, even if you're not in the rucking, they have tons of sleek apparel for the outdoors in addition to their gear uh, that is tough as nails and built to military standards. Also, their apparel and gear offer their scars a lifetime warranty, so you buy the item once and that's it. You're set for life. But you know what the greatest thing is about GORUCK? All of it is made in the good old USA and by special forces veterans, mind you. It doesn't get more badass than that. That's right. America. To check out GORUCK gear, go to gentlemanscofflaw.com slash GORUCK, and anything you buy through that link helps support the show. That's gentlemanscofflaw.com slash GORUCK. Whether it's for your fitness regimen, your, you know, your outdoor lifestyle, or just, you know, a great bag for everyday carry, um, you're going to want to check them out. GORUCK, built in the USA. All right, I'm really excited to have this guest, uh, perfect for this week's episode. Uh, read her book last year called Trick or Treat, The History of Halloween. Um, and among many other books she's written, uh, we'll talk with her about that. Uh, Lisa Morton, thank you so much for coming on. Hey, Jordan, thanks for inviting me to come in. I, I love that background you got there. You got some really spooky looking kind of Halloween uh, decor there. I'd I love to know a little more about that. <laughs> we are in my uh, home office yeah. and um, I love Halloween art. I have been collecting it for many years. Um, I bought this house about five years ago and I'd never had my own office. Yeah. So it was really, really cool for me to take in a, a room and make it over into my space and add all kinds of my favorite art back there. That's really awesome. I'd love to, for our listeners that don't know you, I'd love a little bit about your background, uh, kind of like where, where you came from before getting into, you know, writing about Halloween. Yeah, I'm um, a Southern California native. Um, I've lived virtually my entire life in either L.A. or San Diego. Um, and I grew up in what I think of now as the golden age of trick-or-treat. Um, so I always loved Halloween. I had very indulgent parents who let me watch horror movies and put together monster models and things like that. So I also kind of always loved horror, but I wasn't quite aware that I wanted to write it until I was 15. 
16 and I saw this little movie called The Exorcist. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> and when I saw that with a gigantic sold out audience and saw the effect that movie had on people, that was when I knew I had to do that. Um, so at that point, I pursued screenwriting for quite a few years. And it wasn't until I actually had some moderate success as a screenwriter that I realized that wasn't really for me either. Um, I have had a number of movies made that I was not incredibly proud of and there was my name splashed all over them as writer and at that point I thought you know I'd 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 really like to write stories and books that I can show people and say yes this is my name on this and I wrote this and I actually really like it Um, so it was kind of the early 90s when I turned seriously more to fiction writing and um, then about 10 years later I got into nonfiction writing and started writing about Halloween and so forth. That's awesome. And and I, I did a little bit of research on you and it looked like that you did some you did some work on, on Star Trek and did some modeling and stuff. I mean that, that where did how did that happen? Before I was even a legal adult, uh, <laughs> um, I was very young. And I used to go to a lot of the local science fiction and horror and film conventions when I was a kid. And um, I got to know people there who worked in the industry. And one of those people was a gentleman named Greg Jean. And and Greg is the greatest, as far as I'm concerned, the greatest model maker in history. And um, Greg collected a lot of the same things that I do. And we became friends at the conventions. And he would say to me, if you ever want to work on something, um, you know, just let me know. (laughs) So. So uh, I was in my third year of college at the time. It was 1979. And um, I had just had a bit of a run in with the dean of the film department at my college because I was in my third year. We were still making like Super 8 movies. I went to the dean and I said, when are we going to learn actual production techniques we could use to get jobs with. And the dean actually said to me, don't worry about it. None of you will ever get a job in Hollywood anyways. <laughs> oh, geez. And at that point, I got in touch with my friend, Greg Jean, and I said, I would love to work for you now. And he said, OK, I'm doing Star Trek, the motion picture. And uh, me and actually several of my friends all went to work for him on that. Um, now, one of my friends, I was always never going to be a great model maker, truthfully. I was a hard worker and I I made people laugh and kept people entertained at four in the morning on another all night or that kind of thing. And I was an adequate model maker. But one of my friends is a gentleman named Bill George and Bill George is an Academy Award winning model maker. So um, he went on to ILM after working for Greg. And um, so it was a really, really fun crew to be a part of. And then I got to go on and work on the um, special edition of Close Encounters and um, the Abyss. I was on the Abyss for like six months. Um, So, yeah. That's that's crazy. That it, before you were even legal age to work, you were, you were working in the industry. <laughs> uh, and that's so funny. This is kind of aside from Halloween stuff, but that really is true about like film school. As someone who comes from a film school background, where it's like, unless you're making your own connections in your own way, like just going to school is not going to get you any jobs in Hollywood. You need to kind of carve your own path that there. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. <laughs> That's really cool. Well, I'd love to uh, shift over to talk about your book, uh, Trick or Treat, The History of Halloween, which is fascinating. Uh, one of my favorite holidays, and I feel like it's like everyone's favorite holiday. There's like Christmas and Halloween. Like, <laughs> what, what are the other ones uh, that, you know, that are that are worth mentioning, it seems? Um, but, yeah, I'd love to know, uh, like, because from reading your book, it seems like um, there's no – There's no necessarily specific origin of the way that we know Halloween today, but it's almost like a potluck of a bunch of things. Uh, I love to know where where you think the the origin of Halloween, you know, where it began. That's a a really fun question to answer because there is actually a debate going on within academic circles that there are two different origins for Halloween. And one one side believes that it comes from the ancient Celtic holiday of Samhain. And the other side believes it comes strictly from the Catholic celebration of All Saints Day. And I fall into the former camp. I, I think there's no question that 
it comes from sow and um, because that's where we get the macabre side of it. The Celts believed that um, Samhain was their New Year's celebration and the word itself means summer's end. So it was the time when they um, brought their cattle in from the fields, when they got locked down for the big coming winter. And it was also, as the border between two years, a time when they thought the veils were down, that, that things could cross over from the other world. And those things were not very nice. Um, they believed in these very malicious fairies called the she. And the she would cross over on Samhain night and might set fire to the palace or might bring a corpse back to life or do some really frightening things. And I think that that is absolutely where we get that macabre side to Halloween because there's not really much that's very macabre to celebrating a bunch of saints yeah for sure because i always hear like oh well uh, halloween that you know has christian origins they talk about all saints day um and i'm like well what does that have to do with like <laughs> all like skeletons and, <laughs> and and corpses and goats and all that stuff it seems like a weird connection um how did yeah how did that how does all saints day and the catholic side of things fit into halloween well that's to me, there's another big giveaway in the in the notion that Samhain is the real um, great granddaddy of Halloween because the original date of All Saints Day was May 13th, mm. um, which was had been the date of an old Roman uh, celebration of the dead, and and so the Catholic Church had this doctrine of trying to co-opt existing pagan celebrations and temples and so forth rather than stamp them out. They'd found out they were much more successful with doing that. So when the uh, Catholic missionaries moved into Ireland to try and Christianize the Celts, they moved that date of All Saints Day to November 1st, which is um, uh, the day. Of, it seems like it should be the day after Halloween, but actually the Celts started their celebrations on the eve before, which is why we get hollow evening Halloween. Um, so they moved it. To, uh, to November 1st, the, and they found out that they were only partially successful. The Celts and then eventually the converted Irish and Scottish did not want to give up Samhain. Mm -hmm. So they created actually a second holiday on November 2nd, which is All Souls Day. Um, and All Souls Day also gave Catholics a chance to celebrate the dead beyond just saints. Um, it, All Souls Day, the idea is that you pray for your loved ones who are in purgatory. So All Souls Day is a little more macabre even than All Saints Day. And it did seem to be somewhat more successful at that point in really turning the uh, Celts away from Samhain, although there are parts of Ireland that still refer to the October 31st as Samhain. Wow, that's that's crazy. Uh, um, yeah, well, it seems like how is how is Halloween though evolved? Like especially like in a in like a in our modern society, like how is it? How, like where does stuff like like the, the 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 like the witches and and you know the the devils and the 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 skeleton all that stuff? Well, how does how did that all get roped into this stuff? <laughs> Um, yeah, those are actually three different um, answers. Yeah. Um, witches are, are come from a really ugly place, actually, in Halloween mm. history. They uh, prior to the 16th century, witches were not connected to All Saints Day or to Halloween or to Samhain or any of that. But in um, the 16th century, along comes King James. And yes, this is the same King James who translates the Bible and creates the King James Bible. Um, he was obsessed with demonology, and he also was trying to break away from the Catholic Church. So he found a way to combine those two things and started um, deciding that witches had a major Sabbath on all Saints Eve. Um, and it isn't until the witch trials that take place under him that we start to see those two connected. And at that point, witches start to come in and become a part of the holiday. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a kind of an icky part of <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the holidays history. <laughs> it always seemed like it was it, it seemed like such a inefficient way of, of <laughs> if, if there are, you know, witches doing what they claim. All it takes is just somebody to accuse you and, you, and, and you're done for. 
<laughs> oh yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, and then the, whoever accused you would probably get your property, which helped a little with. Uh, oh geez. Uh, well, yeah, yeah, you just see see some uh, some you know house you like and just go, hey, that's a witch. I yeah. want it. <laughs> yeah, especially if it was an older woman who probably didn't have the resources to defend herself. She may not. She may have lived outside of the village, et cetera, et cetera. This all comes from the fact that I did write another book about witch hunts. Oh wow! So I became fairly knowledgeable in that, but. Um, the, you also mentioned the devil being associated with Hall Halloween, and that's actually one of my favorite stories because um, when I, I set out to write my book, Trick or Treat, A History of Halloween, one of the things I had not answered in my earlier book, The Halloween Encyclopedia, was where does this idea come from that Halloween celebrated a Celtic lord of death? Yeah. Um, and – I actually tracked down a very specific moment in history on that. There was a British surveyor named Charles Valency who was sent over uh, to survey Ireland. And Valency was there for 12 years and he became obsessed with Celtic lore and Celtic history. He recorded hundreds of thousands of bits of Celtic lore and he put out a six volume collection of Celtic folklore and history and so forth. There was just one problem with this, which is that Valency was um, not highly regarded as a scholar. In fact, one peer at the time said he's been responsible for more nonsense than any man uh, in history or something. And um, Valency arbitrarily decided that Samhain did not stand for Summer's End, which every scholar in the world had already come to accept, but yeah. that he traced it back, he thought, to an Indian demon named Saman. And uh, so he just arbitrarily decided that the Celts were worshiping a lord of death. And even though this was a completely nonsensical thing to decide, it was in his books. His books wound up in libraries and it created what I call the alternate history of Halloween. Yeah. That's crazy because that's always the stuff like you hear like, uh, you know, kind of like you'll hear in, in church and stuff. It's like, oh, it's the devil's holiday. That's the origin and stuff where it's like it seems like it's like obviously death is a part of it because of like the, the you know, the the idea of of kind of remembering your dead and praying for your dead and all that stuff that you're you're talk, talking about. But I feel like I don't know. It seems like in in culture all throughout history, there's this idea of of remembering the people that came before and remembering your mortality too like that's not like there's like it's necessarily anything unique to the history of mankind <laughs> right exactly yeah. yeah that's every culture has a cel celebrations and memorials to the dead yeah um well how does all that ancient uh celtic um <laughs> holiday uh co-opted by the catholics and all that stuff how does it become what we know today because it's so it seems I don't know if it if it's it seems like uniquely a uniquely American kind of holiday because it's not the it doesn't seem to be the same around the world. But yeah, how did it get to where it is today? And you you nailed it right there. It is the way we celebrate it is completely American in origin. Um, the Irish and the Scottish brought the holiday with them when they came to this country to escape forties. Celebrated it in a very different way. Um, for them, it was a night that was full of playful pranks and fortune telling games and parties. That part is a little bit, we still have that. But the prank playing came to define the holiday by the end of the 19th century. And by the time we were in the 20th century, what had been innocent pranks where kids on Halloween night would go out and, and like tip over the outhouse or, um, <laughs> On a, disassemble a cart and move it and reassemble it somewhere where it couldn't possibly have gotten to. Um, by 1933, the, the country was becoming more urbanized. Those pranksters moved into cities and caused millions of dollars of damage. They were setting fires. They were breaking windows. Windows. They were tripping people on the streets. And because of that, a lot of cities were going to ban Halloween. Wow. Um, and fortunately, some cooler heads prevailed and people started to say, you know, we might be more successful buying these kids off. <laughs> 
So that's exactly what they did. Many of the cities created these interesting little like party pamphlets that they distributed to homeowners. And uh, the idea was give them a party, give them a costume, give them some treats. And that worked. So uh, that's how Trick or Treat got started. And of course, by later in the 20th century, we now uh, Halloween is now all about Trick or Treat. It's about um, parties. That's all very American. Um, and by the way, we trick or treat uh, i've read things that try to extend it back to the celts oh no the celts dressed in costumes and masks to scare off evil spirit no they didn't um yeah we have absolutely no evidence to support that idea whatsoever uh, uh i'm afraid the whole idea of masking and costuming it comes from nothing more than buying off some pranksters <laughs> Well, it's a fun, it's a fun idea. I mean, that was like always my favorite thing as a kid is like, oh, I get to be somebody different on, uh, you know, on Halloween. It still is one of my favorite things. But um, yeah, that was like, that was always a big thing is like, I looked forward to the costume more than anything else. Like, what am I going to be this year? It was always like something from Batman movie or something as a kid. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, I, that element has always been there yeah. with the costuming. It's it's great fun to, to be empowered that one night a year as someone else. And although I feel a little sorry for days because when I was growing up, we trick-or-treated without parents. So yeah. you felt really powerful on that night. It's like, oh, it's my night of freedom and I'm somebody <laughs> else and yeah, yeah it was really fun well i i was the same way too where i maybe it was just in the where i grew up but at a certain age it was just my friends and, and i we would just go trick-or-treating without parents and that was that that was the freedom you were on foot and you just like would explore all these different neighborhoods see how many houses you can <laughs> you could uh you could hit in one night it became a lot of a, a lot of fun it, it was always fun as a kid but as i got older it was like it, it was like exploring, exploring the town, a chance to explore the town. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, where does like this idea of um, like the like stuff like the jack-o'-lantern and stuff? I always wondered where that where that came from, because it seems like such a, a weird thing. I'm going to take this vegetable and turn it into a light. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, when you look at it that way, um, that actually is another prank that has a history as a prank oh, really? that the Irish used to play. Um, I will demolish one misconception here, too, which is the notion that the Irish carved pumpkins. They did not. They didn't have pumpkins. Um <laughs> They had, though, very large turnips. And so they took the existing legends of Jack the Trickster, and Jack was this legendary um, trickster who had fooled the devil three times. So when he finally died, the devil was mad at him, wouldn't let him into hell, and threw him a burning coal. And Jack put that burning coal into a gourd or a turnip or a pumpkin and used that to light his way as he wandered the earth as this sort of spirit forever and so on halloween night the irish would carve these jack-o-lanterns um, and set them out by the side of a dark road or in a field or next to a door to to try and scare people and uh so when they came to america they brought that tradition with them but they found these magnificent pumpkins which made fantastic jack-o-lanterns and that's kind of how that came about. And um, what's interesting is it took a while for the pumpkin to be the accepted form of the jack-o'-lantern. I hmm. have uh, an 1897 party guide, which I think is the first one ever published for Halloween, where they talk about carving many things into jack-o'-lanterns. And I have no idea how they could carve a cucumber or an apple. <laughs> <laughs> but they absolutely mention those things and they're right alongside pumpkins. Wow. That's crazy. Yeah, I guess you could put a little birthday candle maybe in an apple. I don't know, but there's the core, so I don't know how that would work. <laughs> it's always such a mess, though. That's my least favorite thing about it. Like, I love carving it, but I don't know where to put all the stuff. And then your whole house smells like that. It doesn't smell good when you open up a pumpkin. It just, it just smells weird around the house. <laughs> yeah. Um. So I guess is that where like where, like the idea of this kind of like orange and black and kind of the branding of Halloween. I mean, does that? I assume that maybe that comes from the pumpkins, or how did that? How did it become that become the look of the holiday? 
Yeah, absolutely. That's where that comes from. Mm -hmm. Um, Again, if you look at some early 20th century guides on decorating for Halloween, they say yellow and brown are the colors of the Mm -hmm. holiday. Kind of a fall Uh, harvest kind of thing, maybe. (laughs) Exactly right. Yeah, it wasn't until maybe the 1910s that the pumpkin really becomes established. And then we get that shift to orange and black with black being the night and spooky things, darkness, death, that kind of thing. Um, Yeah. So at that point, the color scheme is really orange and black. Wow. That's, it's crazy how that, how that, I guess it's probably the same thing with like Christmas and Easter and all that stuff. The third things associated with the holiday (laughs) that just kind of evolve over time and become the brand that we all, all know and love. Um, One thing that I wanted to touch on is as a kid talking about a kid trick or treating, I remember there was all these crazy rumors going around. Like there's always this sense of fear that kind of almost in a way made the night more exciting, but you wouldn't tell your parents that. But like this idea that there were people out there putting razor blades and candy and apples and stuff. Uh, How much of that do we know to be? Because I've never seemed to have found anything that actually links to a real case where that's happened. I mean, how how often does that kind of thing happen? And you... you don't find anything that links that to a real case. Well, the that came from, I think it was 1963, and there was a woman in New York named Helen File, and Helen had decided she was tired of giving treats to older kids. So she started putting things like ant buttons in the older kids' trick-or-treat things. Okay. <laughs> um and that ended up becoming kind of the start of the whole anonymous psycho putting razor blades in apples. Um, in the 70s, there was a story of a man who had tried to poison his son to collect on an insurance claim. He laced the poor kid's pixie stick with arsenic. That led to the idea that there were anonymous psychos poisoning your candy. Wow. Um, and there really is no evidence to support any of that. They These are essentially urban legends. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. Crazy. I believed all of that as a kid. I, I, I remember, <laughs> two, I think it was, maybe it was a Halloween movie sequel. There was like a kid that's got a razor blade <laughs> that he bit into in an apple. I'm sure that made it worse. <laughs> um, that's crazy. Um I'd love to shift over and talk about your new book, which I believe just came out this month, right? The, uh, the, the, it's called Calling the Spirits, the History of Seances. Yeah, it technically came out at the end of September, but it took a while because of COVID for everything to ship. So oh, yeah. it really is an October release. <laughs> well, that, that seems like it should be an October release. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's crazy. So uh, tell me about how you started working on this book and, and like kind of why you wanted to tackle it. Um, It actually, truthfully, was not my idea. I had done a book for a a publishing company called Reaction Books, and that book was Ghost to Haunted History. I did that a few years ago. Um, That came out in 2015. And after doing that book, um, my editor at Reaction approached me with the idea of doing a history of seances. And I thought that sounded like so much fun, and I had some grounding in it already because of doing the ghost book that I immediately agreed to do that one and it turned out to be even way more fun to research than i ever anticipated um yeah i never i never expected quite to find this uh, a lot of the seance history centers on the 19th century victorian and especially the ones in Britain. And when you really dig into that whole little group of people, it's f- just incredibly rich with scandals and gossip and strange stories. And it was it was really fun. Well, I'd love to talk about this. Like, what what is, like, the history of seances? Like, how did that, at least, like, the what we know of, like, nowadays, how did, where does that come from? I was surprised when I started researching the book to find out how recent it was. I actually yeah. thought the idea of a group of people gathering in a circle, using a medium to call spirits, would probably have gone back thousands of years. It does. It goes back to 1848. It has a very specific beginning with two teenage girls named Maggie and Katie Fox who are living in a um, uh, big house outside of Rochester, New York with their parents in 1848. And they start 
hearing things they say in this house. And um, the, the, what they're hearing are rappings and knockings around the house. And they start telling their parents that they that the house is haunted and that they can communicate with these spirits. And they start doing these things where they will ask the spirits questions and the spirits are rapping answers. And news of this gets out. And within weeks, hundreds of people are just sending on this house asking to see this in action. And the girls turn out to be only too happy to supply demonstrations. <laughs> within a short time, their older sister, Leah, who lives in Rochester, brings them to her house and starts charging people to come in and witness this. And it turns out to be just easy to place people around a table because then wrappings can sort of sound from the table, the table can move and so forth. And that becomes the form of our modern seance. And, and this becomes so popular and so famous and spreads very quickly to both sides of the Atlantic um, that within a few years of news of the Fox sisters getting out, there are hundreds of people claiming to be mediums in both Great Britain and America. And spiritualism is born out of that. And spiritual is the idea. It's an actual religion. It is based on the idea that you can communicate with the spirits via a medium that the spirits um, will answer and so forth. It also depended on, at least in the beginning, on the idea that it was the only religion that could be proven scientifically. Wow. And that was turned out to be one of the funniest parts of the book for me was the way the spiritualist would tie themselves in logic knots whenever they were debunked again. <laughs> that's uh, that's funny because what I know about the like uh, spiritualism at that time is just being a magic nerd from a kid uh, as a kid, um, knowing about Houdini and how. He spent a lot of time uh, trying to debunk spiritualism. I'd love to talk a little bit about that because that's a fascinating story too. Oh, it sure is. And I, I cover Houdini extensively in the book or rather what I really enjoyed covering was the uh, friendship between Houdini and Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Oh, wow which is one of the most interesting friendships in history, I think, because on the one hand, you had Houdini, who had started as a believer and had become a skeptic. And on the other hand, you have Doyle, who started as a skeptic and became a believer. And by the time these two men met, um, Doyle was the hardcore spiritualist who was giving lectures and writing books on it. And Houdini was doing the exact opposite thing, also giving lectures and writing books. His book, um, A Magician Among the Spirits, is the classic debunking of mediums and seance practices. Um, they started with a wonderful admiration for each other. Houdini uh, loved writers. He had a huge library. He loved getting letters from Doyle and so forth. And, um, but it all kind of fell apart on this one afternoon when they were vacationing together. Their two families were vacationing and I think it was Atlantic city. And, um, at the time Doyle's wife had just taken up mediumship and Doyle said, my wife would like to hold a seance with you. And so Houdini went to the seance and Doyle's wife practiced automatic writing, which was the idea that the spirits would enter her and she would just madly write messages from them. And she wrote something like 21 pages that day, which were supposedly from Houdini's mother. Houdini worshipped his mother. He actually refers to her many times as my sainted mother. Um, he would have done anything to have received a real message from her, but he, as he noted himself, um, she didn't speak a word of English and he were <laughs> multiple pages all in English. Um, he didn't buy any of it, and it caused a huge rift between him and Conan Doyle that turned into a massive feud. So it really was a, a very interesting relationship between these two men. Wow, that, that's insane. I, I, uh, I know that, that I, I've, this has been a while since I've, I've read on, on this, but it seems like he spent a lot of time trying to recreate kind of the, the seance experience. Do you, do you touch about that a, a little bit in the book? Or? 
Oh yeah, yeah. He um, he would do that, and he would also he loved to debunk mediums. Yeah. Um, he would. Uh, there are many demonstrations of him doing things like um, some of the mediums would produce things like a spirit arm in their seance, and he would show, for example, how they could create the spirit arm by dipping his arm in some um, latex, that kind of thing. Um, he also had a very interesting involvement with debunking um, Marjorie Crandon, who was a very famous medium who was known as the Blonde Witch of Lime Street. (laughs) And um, Marjorie was interesting because she uh, would perform her seances quite often in the nude. Um, The idea was that that meant she couldn't be hiding anything, but it also, of course, lent more than a whiff of eroticism (laughs) to her seances, which were probably very effective with many of the sitters. Um, And uh, there was even speculation that Marjorie's uh, husband, um, who was a doctor, had surgically um, enlarged her vagina to allow her to hide things in her vagina. (laughs) That's that's insane. Oh man. What a weird what a weird history. <laughs> <laughs> um one thing, uh yeah, I my experience too with Houdini stuff too is recently I was went to the Magic Castle in Hollywood. They have a whole Houdini room and I don't know if it's on his birthday or his death day, they like do a Houdini seance if you're there every every year. <laughs> Yeah, they do. They they also have a regular Houdini seance that's really fun that's put on by a magician. Um, and uh, the idea is that he recreates many of the things that mediums, the tricks that mediums were using to um, defraud their clients quite often. And um, the whole history of mediums and magicians is interesting, too. Um, there is uh, some speculation that the mediums were routinely buying their supplies from many of the same houses that, that supplied magicians. Wow. Um, <laughs> um, I mean, we know for a fact that that some of the mediums were using things like telescoping rods that they could use to fly things around in darkness. Um, they were using phosphorus oil to create glowing globs. And so they were definitely using many of the same tricks that the magicians were using. Wow. That's so cool. I, I it, it, a lot of this stuff, it seems like maybe in a time too, like it was playing maybe on people's uh, just kind of just uh, night, you know, their naivety, I would say naivete or whatever, um, of, of just kind of like this idea, like it always seems like it's like, it's something where it's like, Oh, this kind of, this is an ancient art, like coming from the East or something like that, where it's like, we're Americans like, Oh, well, if it's from the East and it's ancient, it must be, uh, it must be true. I mean, <laughs> right. And I apologize for that phone going oh, off right. just now. I'm sure it's the spirits calling. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, they they definitely did use that sort of interest in Orientalism at the time. That was huge in 19th century Victorian society. So that played into it. Many of the mediums had spirit guides who were supposedly of Eastern origin um, and later on of Native American origin. The um, the the real life Native American leader Blackhawk became a spirit guide to probably hundreds of mediums after his death. Wow. Um, many were claiming association with Blackhawk, and um, yes, the definitely and the, the gullibility issue is really interesting to me too. We certainly see it come into play after wars, and that makes perfect sense because people after. The Civil War and after uh, World War One had so many people had lost their young sons, their young husbands, their brothers in those wars that they were very anxious, of course, to receive any sort of word from them. And in that case, I this is one one area of skepticism where I disagree with Houdini. Houdini ended up deciding that that was all really bad. That these people were obtaining a, a completely false comfort from attending seances and and patronizing mediums and i actually am not sure i agree with that i think that 
they were obtaining real comfort from this. And I have a hard time finding anything wrong with that. Interesting. That's, that's a, that's a, that's a nice take. Um, one thing that I wanted to touch on is again, too, like the idea of this stuff coming from, coming from the East, like the idea of like Ouija boards and stuff. It seems like that was, that seems to be like something that was just kind of made up here in the United States, but they always claim it some has some ancient kind of <laughs> origins. Well, they claim that for marketing purposes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It it has a it has some forerunners in so far as some of the before the Ouija board was patented, and I think it was eighteen ninety one. The mediums would occasionally use things they called talking boards or spirit boards, and it was very similar to the Ouija board, a series of numbers laid out, and you would either slide a glass along them, um, or you might just point at them and ask the spirits to rap whenever you pointed at the right letter. Um, what One of the interesting things about the Ouija board is that when it was patented, it there's absolutely no mention whatsoever of spirit communication. It was patented entirely as a parlor game. <laughs> and it didn't really take on that connotation of being a device for communicating with spirits until about the 1910s. Okay. Um, and at that point, there were a few things that happened that caused it to become much more serious as a spirit communication device, I think especially in World War I, when people were desperate, as I mentioned before, to communicate with loved ones, and now you had this thing that you could put on your kitchen table, you didn't have to go out to a medium. <laughs> um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, communicate with the uh, with the ancient dead brought to you by Milton Bradley <laughs> or whatever right, it was. Exactly. I don't know. Yeah. Like Hasbro yeah. or whoever makes it. That's crazy. Um, well, this this has been a really fascinating conversation. I don't want to give away all of the stuff in your books, but if people want to find you, Lisa, where can they go? Um, www.lisamorton.com is a good place to start. And from there, you can follow me on my various social media or check out my books. And my books are pretty much available just about everywhere. That's awesome. Well, thanks again for doing this. And we'll have to have you back on and talk about tons of these fascinating books that you've, that you've worked on. There's so much to unpack. Yeah, I love to, Jordan. Thanks a lot. Gents, it's fall, and you know what that means? You guessed it, pumpkin everything. Now, before you go and start calling me basic, let me tell you about Phoenix Shaving's new fragrance line called Atomic Pumpkin. Now, this isn't your run-of-the-mill seasonal pumpkin pie offering that everybody's doing. This is something a little more sophisticated and alluring. This aftershave and soap line stays within the classic bay rum tradition, but adds a fall spin because Atomic Pumpkin Bay Rum is steeped in classic pumpkin pie spices for up to six weeks before the batch is complete. It's like some, it's like a, like almost like a crazy whiskey or cigar or anything that's aged. I'm running out of, I don't, what else is aged? Uh, only whiskey and cigars, wine, I guess. I don't know. I don't know, guys. I don't know. The point is, I mean, look at these ingredients. There's West Indian Bay, Moro Blood Orange, allspice, cinnamon, ginger, nutmeg, and elemi resin. I don't know what that is, but it sounds festive. This is some fall masculine magic done right, guys. So if you're wanting to step up your grooming game this fall, maybe impress the lady in your life, make a great impression at work or school, then check out this limited edition line by Phoenix Shaving. Just go to gentlemanscofflaw.com slash shave and a portion of anything you buy with that link goes to help support this podcast. So you get to kill two birds with one stone. You support the show you love and you get to fight off ladies with a stick because you smell so damn good. Is that sexist? I don't know. Maybe. But that's why I'm a scofflaw and a gentleman. All right, so that's gentlemanscofflaw.com slash shave and stop being a slave to the drugstore shave. All right, um, great guest at Lisa Morton. Uh, just a, a tr you know, treasure box of all sorts of interesting facts and history. Love to have her back on, talk about tons of other stuff she's working on. 
Um, you know, we are giving away uh, this week's uh, this month's giveaway. We're giving away a free CAD aftershave um, from Phoenix Shaving. So be sure to check out our Instagram if you want to uh, to partake in that. Uh, Zach, what are, do you anything you want to plug? Is there anything you want to plug right now? Sure. Uh, I actually have nothing to plug myself, but I would love to plug. Uh, my friend Elise Willem's amazing new Halloween themed kids book, A Night in Halloween House. It really harkens back to those old, you know, fun Goosebumps books from when we were kids, assuming that we're all the same age. But <laughs> it's a, a great story and a lot of fun. And and and, and it, it, you know, it's Halloween in like three days. Probably it's Halloween today when you put out this podcast. <laughs> yeah. So if you want to check it out, go to Amazon or wherever books are, wherever you could steal books. <laughs> I just, <laughs> yeah, but we could put the link, the Amazon link in the show notes so that you can yeah. get it directly. Um, want to plug our little uh, merchandise shop we got a lot of new stuff on there new designs new t-shirts masks uh new neck gaiters that are new this week uh kind of like the one i'm wearing but uh with one of our logos on it looks like a skeleton smoking a pipe when you put it on your face which is why is that called a gator do we know this have we discussed this i don't i think i don't know i really don't know originally gators were like i think they were like spats right for like over they would go over your boots to put tra- protect stuff from getting into your because it looks what it looks like is spanx for your face <laughs> pretty much it like yeah. you don't like the shape of your face you need something real <laughs> tied up around it yeah. everyone's like oh there's a there's a thin-faced gentleman going around <laughs> yeah uh, yeah i don't know why <laughs> I don't know where they, I've always heard it called a buff before I heard gator, but gator, I guess, is the generic term and buff is like the name brand. So I guess, oh. yeah. So I don't know, <laughs> but, uh, I like these cause they're, they're really easy to put on and off. Like I prefer the, the gator to the mask style. And then, I uh, I, I also use them in hiking cause you know, in California it can get really dusty and, uh, I just like being able, like even on without COVID, uh, it's useful against dust and wind and that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. yeah no, there's nothing worse than getting the wind in the face and feeling like the little trail of snot coming out of nostril, you know, yeah. and then you, you have to decide if you don't have a Kleenex, what are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to do the, the arm swipe or you're going to just wait for it to, to fall and oh, catch no. it with your mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can always do that. Catch it with your mouth. Sometimes I'll just like try and like whip it out of the way, you know, <laughs> maybe the wind yeah. will blow it out. <laughs> but it seems like I'm always the one with the runny nose and I look over to everyone else and they're fine. Yeah. So I always feel judged. Well, maybe, maybe you just, uh, you know, maybe your maybe immune system need, is working better. What I need is a, a, a gator. Yeah. A I, gentleman scarf log gator. Exactly. That's what you need. Uh, even though I'm not wearing one right now, I'm wearing an example of what one will look like if there was a graphic on now, it. <laughs> this is just the, now if you just had straight black, Gators for gentlemen scarf law. Yeah. I think that would not do a good job no. advertising the no, show. It wouldn't for sure. Um, no. it would it would help make people look more like uh, uh I don't know, like robbers or something. Yeah, <laughs> that would help. But that's not really the goal of the podcast. No, we're, we're not a Halloween. We're not a spirit store. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> We could be. When are these going to be available? We'll get them right away? Yeah, you can get them right now at the Gentleman's Scoff Law uh, shop. If you go to gentlemanscofflaw.com, click the shop link, and it'll take you there. Um, I think that's it, Zach. I don't know what else to plug. I mean, I hope you have a happy Halloween. I hope you have everything. a great Halloween, too. A great, safe, responsible Halloween with tons of spookiness that is not related to everything going on in the real world like fun spookiness fun spookiness like uh like clowns that are supposed to be fun oh, no, but they're scary fun. that's that's not fun we don't need to bring them into it <laughs> no no clowns into it all right man well thanks for doing this and you are a gentleman and a scoff law my friend uh, thanks for having me you're a gentleman and a, a scoff law 
You should host a podcast on such things. Maybe I might. I just might. This has been the Gentleman Scofflaw Podcast. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcatcher. Visit us on the interwebs at gentlemanscofflaw.com. Captain says, his ass on the river, we ain't getting home if we don't break through. So damn cold, I can't help but shiver. Rise and shine, we got work to do. Hey!